بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا كريم All praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance and we seek the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evils of our souls and the adverse consequences of our deeds. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees guidance upon, then none can misguide that person. And whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees misguidance upon, then none can guide him. And peace and salutations be upon the final messenger, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, O servants of Allah and O children of Adam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am grateful once again, and I should say this as I started, because today is the final session of this wonderful trip here to Qatar and to you all and to Fanar. And as I started, I must thank uh, Fanar for their wonderful invite, their hospitality, and for making this trip a reality. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to make this sitting our last sitting. I ask Him to gather us together many a time in this world. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us in the hereafter and gather us in Jannah with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen. The topic today is an extremely important one. Maybe the most important topic of the topics discussed. And I suppose it, it is relative, right? Some topics are more important to some people given their need for a particular topic. But the reason why I say today's topic is very important is because the topic deals with the heart, a heart. And we know that yourself and myself, we are basically made up of a few entities and components. And if we look at these entities and components, then we find that we are a body, we are a mind, we are a nafs, we are a ruh, which is a soul, and we are a heart. So we five things. We are five things. Should I repeat it? We are a body, a mind, a nafs, a ruh, and a heart. Now we're not going to discuss all these five. We're going to focus in on the heart. However, I want to shed some light regarding the nafs because this is a form of confusion and it's a question that's always asked what is the nafs and what's the difference between the nafs and the ruh right what is this nafs it's an arabic term an arabic noun called nafs noon fa seen and in the english language we can loosely write it as n a f s or spell it using n a f s a nafs what is a nafs and how different it is from the ruh the ruh means a soul the ruh means a soul. So what is this nafs and how different, how different it is or is it to the ruh? The ruh is the soul. The nafs as taught to us by the ulama is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala joins between the soul and the body outside of a mother's womb. So when a child is born and they live with and they have to obviously you have to have the soul and the body present to be alive so basically being alive outside of the mother's womb necessitates you being a nafs the ruh is the soul itself minus the body when the soul is removed at the time of death we don't say it's a nafs and that's what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when one of the companions passed away he passed away and his eyes remained opened his eyes remained open. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا الرُّوحِ 
when the soul is lifted. He didn't say nafs. He said soul. Why? Because here there's a detachment between the soul and the body. Is that clear? So that is uh, what has been taught to us regarding the nafs. Today's topic is the topic of the heart. And that is why it would be appropriate if we started this talk by saying all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who granted us this heart and said yawma la yanfa'u malun wala banun illa man atallaha biqalbin salim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the day of qiyamah is a day in which nobody's wealth or nobody's children will benefit them the only benefit they stand to gain is a pure heart the only benefit on the day of qiyamah is for the one who meets allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a pure heart and inshallah throughout the course of this particular talk we will discuss uh, those criterion pertaining to what necessitates a pure heart and as we praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should praise Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the final messenger who said, Ala inna lil jasadi mudra. Indeed, there is nothing about your body except a piece of flesh. He didn't say that your body has something important called a piece of flesh. He said there's nothing about it except a piece of flesh. Ida saluha, if this piece of flesh is pure, saluha al jasadu kullu then the entire body will be correct and pure. وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ And if this piece of flesh becomes corrupt, فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ Then the entire body will be corrupt. أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبُ Indeed, the piece of flesh being referred to is this heart. Now, for those who are well versed in the Arabic language, you'll appreciate the methodology of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we should say peace and blessings be upon him, or sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we hear his name, because this is from the good etiquettes with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was eloquent when he said the statement. He didn't say, as I said earlier, that there's an important piece of flesh in your body and it's the heart. Rather, he said, there's nothing about your body except your heart. And for those who study language, you appreciate this formation. Because even in the English language, if I said, Yusuf is standing, what's your name? Uzair. Uzair is standing. We won't make you stand, right? Uzair is standing. If we said Uzair is standing, then in the English language, this is known as an open statement. I have the ability to add to it. I can say he is standing and he's wearing a black thobe with white stripes and he's holding um, a jersey that is orange and he has a lovely watch. I can continue adding to this particular statement. But if I said there's nothing about Uzair except that he is standing, this is known as a closed-ended statement, meaning the speaker has focused in on the most important aspect of discussion regarding Uzair. And that is that he is standing. I don't care about what he's wearing. I don't care about what color clothes he's wearing, what he's holding, what watch he's wearing, the type of watch he's wearing, the color of the watch he's wearing, and so on and so forth. I am focusing the listener on the most important point that I want to highlight. And that is the fact that he is standing. So here the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, there is nothing about the body except this piece of flesh. He zoomed in and focused in on the point of discussion, on the most important entity and element of you and I as a creation. And that is the heart, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Excellent. O servants of Allah and O children of Adam, Understand that we are not living in paradise. Paradise is a place of everlasting happiness. And understand that you and I are not living in everlasting doom. For everlasting doom and destruction is in a place known as the hellfire. And the place known as the hellfire in the Arabic language is called Jahannam. This is a place 
of everlasting doom. You and I are in a period before that period, a period known as the dunya, known as the world, a place that has moments of happiness and has moments of difficulty, a place that has happiness which is not equivalent to the happiness of the hereafter, and has difficulty which is not equivalent in intensity to the difficulty of the hereafter. We know that the Prophet ﷺ said that paradise is a place مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ which no eye has ever seen وَلَا أُذْنٌ سَمِعَتْ which no ear has ever heard وَمَا خَطَرَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِ بَشَرْ And it is a place that no heart has ever imagined. Subhanallah. If you imagine the most amazing thing you can imagine in your mind, know that paradise has better. Know that paradise has better. Do you allow me to steer off the topic a little bit? Just a little bit. They say that our abilities are limited. All our abilities are limited. We can only see a certain difference, uh, a distance. And we can only hear a certain wavelength of sound. And we can only carry a certain amount of weight. We have limitations in terms of our abilities. But when we look at all our faculties and we analyze these limitations, we find that there's one entity that has fewer limitations than the rest. And that is known as our ability to imagine. Our ability to imagine. We can imagine anything we want. I'm saying this to you, and I gave this example to the brothers and sisters in London uh, a week ago or 10 days ago. I think it's pertinent. We can lighten the mood a little bit before we dive into the serious stuff. There's always a starter before the main meal. So this mind can imagine anything. You can be sitting here right now, and you can imagine that you're sitting in Hawaii if you want. Is anybody going to stop you? Can anyone stop you? Can they? No. You can imagine it. And you can enjoy it. In fact, you can close your eyes and disappear from this place because you're so deep in thought regarding this new place that you're in. You're not in the humid city of Doha. You're in the cool, breezy seaside. Right? Nobody can stop you. And if you want to understand this further, understand it like this. They say once upon a time, there were three people. And they were on a journey. And they took provisions for their journey. But what happened is, they didn't have a GPS like we have today. Satnav, TomTom, Tom, right? Google Maps. So, they were in the forest, traversing, and they became lost. They became lost. So because they became lost, this took a couple more days from their planned journey. And as a result, the provisions that they had with them became depleted, except a bowl of milk, a bowl of milk. So now they were in a dilemma. We three people, one bowl of milk. How on earth are we going to distribute this milk between us? So one of them was very clever. He said, you know what? I have an, an idea. They said, what? He says, what we'll do is, we'll place the bowl of milk on a high tree so no wild animal can drink it. And we'll all go to sleep. And when we wake up in the morning, we'll tell each other about the dream which we had. And the person who has the best dream gets the bowl of milk. How's that? They said, perfect. That sounds doable. It's conducive, <laughs> right? So this is what they did. And they went to sleep. And they woke up the next day and they said, right guys, let's discuss the all-important issue of the dreams that we had so that we can have breakfast. So they asked the first person, what did you dream about? Now obviously he didn't dream about anything, but he has a mind that can imagine. So he said, for the sake of the bowl of milk, he said, you know what? I had an amazing dream. An amazing dream. They said, what was this dream about? He says, I dreamt I was on the third heaven. Third heaven, wow. And he started describing the third heaven and how he met Prophet Joseph, Yusuf alayhi salam, and how handsome he was, and everything he could conjure up. Everything he could describe, he described. He used his abilities to imagine 
for the sake of his stomach. <laughs> he needed the bowl of milk. So the other two, they were starting to look despondent. They said, subhanallah, this, was, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. So they went to traveler number two. What did you dream about? He says, traveler number one, you had an amazing dream. But sorry to say, my dream was better. Now obviously he didn't dream anything as well. So they said, what was your dream about? He says, which heaven were you on? He said, the third heaven. He goes, me, I was on the fifth heaven. I was on the fifth heaven. And we know that the fifth heaven is more beautiful than the third heaven. So what did he do? He bettered the description of the third heaven. And traveler number one looked down, despondent, as he saw the bowl of milk evaporating. So then they turned to traveler number three. And traveler number three said, yes, what can I do for you? They said, we're waiting to hear the dream. We want to hear what you dreamt last night. Now, how many heavens are there? I can't hear you. You guys got to be alive here. Come on. Seven. Seven. He said, I'm too ashamed to tell you about my dream. They said, what do you mean you're too ashamed to tell us about your dream? You have to tell us it was an agreement. Let's hear it and let's finish this because the sun is rising and this bowl of milk is going to evaporate. Tell us what you dreamt about. He goes, I'm too ashamed. Please, just leave me out of it. He said, no. We had an agreement. Let's hear it. He goes, okay. Because you're forcing me, last night I was in a deep, deep, deep sleep. Really enjoying the sleep. When suddenly somebody woke me up. So they said, who woke you up? We were sleeping. We were the only ones here. He says, no, no, there was somebody. There was this knight on a black horse. And this horse was very well groomed. It was groomed as you see the king's horses groomed. He's describing. He's imagining. Can you see how this mind can describe? Right? The, the purpose of the story is to understand how we can imagine and describe. He says... This person came and he had a staff, a sharp staff, and he poked me. And that's what woke me up. So they said, what happened? He says, I jumped up. And I said, yes, how can I help you, sir? He said, that's a very good question. You can help me. Climb up the tree and get the bowl of milk down. <laughs> so they said, what did you do? He says, I told him, no, I can't. I have an agreement here with these two gentlemen here. We have an agreement. I can't. He said, climb up, get the bowl of milk down, or the staff will touch you. <laughs> and you know what that means, right? We're trying to be diplomatic with our words. So he said, look, uh, look, I don't want any, any harm to occur here, but I just want you to understand what I'm doing is not allowed. He says, look, I'm not interested in what is allowed and what is not allowed. Climb the tree, get the bowl of milk down. So he says, I climbed the tree and I brought the bowl of milk down. So the two people said, what do you mean you brought the bowl of milk down? He goes, I brought it down. They said, what did you do with it? He says, I went and gave it to him. They said, you gave it to him? He says, no, 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 listen what happened. Listen to what happened. As I walked to him, I thought, let me walk slowly. He might go away, but he didn't. And as I gave him the bowl of milk, he picked up his staff and he pointed it at me. And he says, no, you drink the bowl of milk. So I, he, they said, what did you do? He says, I told him, no, I can't. You know, you will be gone tomorrow. I have to face my two companions. We have an agreement. He said, drink the bowl of milk or the staff will touch you. So he goes, what could I do? I started drinking it. But I was drinking it very slowly. So that maybe he might go and there'll be some left for you all. So they said, what happened? He said, that this person said, drink it till the last drop or this staff will touch you. So I'm sorry, I drank the bowl of milk. So the other two looked down and said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Why didn't you scream? We could have woken up and helped you. So he said, I screamed and screamed. But you were on the third heaven and you were on the fifth heaven, you couldn't hear me. Right? So, do you understand how this mind can imagine? But even though it can imagine and describe, you can't imagine Jannah. 
and you can't describe Jannah. So that is Jannah and that is Jahannam and this is the dunya that we live in. When you understand that this world has moments of happiness and has difficult low moments, then understand that the life that we live is not a static life. The iman that we have does not run on a static level. The contentment of the heart that we feel will never remain static. Rather, it moves up and moves down with the passing of every day. This means that it's dynamic in nature. It's not static, rather it's dynamic. It has its ups, it has its downs. This is the reality of this world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this to us in his book when he said, إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدْحًا فَمُلَاقِيهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that you and I, we are on a tiresome journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not sailing and freestyling, whatever that means. We are on a tiresome journey to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, likens us in this world to a farmer that tills his land before the rains using his pick. How he toils underneath the midday sun, digging and digging and digging. This is toiling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes our journey to him as this farmer. So understand that it will be a life dynamic with ups and downs. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave us astray. He left us informed for he sent prophets and he revealed books to teach us the reality of the life that we live in. To grant us perspective. Because perspective is about knowing who you are and about knowing where you are and about knowing where you're going and about knowing how to get there successfully. That's perspective. We weren't just left like that to deal with these ups and downs with no arsenal. La, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. He revealed books, he sent prophets, and they gave us perspective. Once again, they told us who we are, and where we are, and where we are heading towards, and how to get there successfully. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So once again, who are we? I said earlier, we are a body, a mind, a nafs, a ruh, and a heart. This heart as I established, is the most important entity. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught this to us in many ahadith. I said the most important of them earlier. If we look at another narration, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرْ إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ أَجْسَادِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرْ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ He says, God Almighty does not look at your images and does not look at your bodies and the way you dress and your external. Rather, God Almighty judges you based on your heart and based on your deeds. This again makes manifest how important the heart is. And that is why we've heard the famous hadith narrated by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, the second Khalifa, the second Khalifa. What did he say? He said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ there's nothing about your actions except the intention present when those actions were observed. Remember the closed-ended statement? He didn't say actions are judged by intentions. He said there is nothing about your actions except that they are based upon the intention present when this action was performed. Did you observe this action for God Almighty? If so, it will be kept for you. However, if you observe an act that seems to be an act of worship, but the intent and intention behind it was to please someone from the creation of God Almighty, then this act is rejected and is null and is void. Thus, the focus here is the heart. The success for yourself and myself, O servants of Allah, is being freed from the hellfire and being entered into paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul shall taste death. And then Allah says that every soul 
will be given its due on the day of Qiyamah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ And the one who is saved from the hellfire, وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ and is entered into paradise, فَقَدْ فَازْ has indeed succeeded. فَقَدْ has indeed succeeded. This is success. Success of the year after. And don't forget the opening ayah that I recited, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the day of Qiyamah will not be of benefit, meaning the benefits present on the day of Qiyamah, if any, will not be for the one who had financial standing and for the one who had a material well-being or for the one who had many a child. Rather, it's for the one who meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a pure heart. Now, there are types of hearts as taught to us by our scholars. They say that there is a heart which is considered a dark heart, a heart that has no light of belief in it because the possessor of this heart is a disbeliever. So the light of belief, Iman is a light that radiates from the heart. Again, understand how important the heart is. Iman radiates from the heart. And a person who has a dark heart is a person that does not have belief. Thus, this person is a disbeliever. Then we have another type of a heart. And this is the heart of a person who is confused. Thus, this heart is called a confused, rebellious heart, a treacherous heart. And this is the heart of those that were found at the time of the Prophet ﷺ when he migrated to Medina and Islam began to become prevalent and there were benefits to attribute yourself to Islam. This was the nature of the hearts of the hypocrites, the munafiqun. They said outwardly and explicitly that they believed but implicitly, they did not believe. This is regarded as, or this is called rather, a treacherous heart, a confused heart. Then the scholars say that we have something known as a mixed heart. It's a heart that has love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a heart that has love for the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is a heart as well that seems to follow its desires, seems to follow its whims and its fancies of the self, of the nafs. So it has love for Allah, it has love for his prophet, but it's weak with regards to dealing to the innate desires of the self. And remember we said the self is when the soul and the body are attached to each other. So this body has whims, it has fancies, but the sharia, ah, the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Islam, which is a way of life, governed us, gave us perspective, taught us the do's and taught us the don'ts. And there might be certain don'ts that our nafs is inclined towards. Right? And this heart is weak in ensuring that this, na this nafs doesn't fall prey to its desires. So it is, it is a heart that is mixed with the love of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they love to follow the instructions of of, of Allah and his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it's weak in terms of following what it loves to follow. And many of us can relate to this heart. And this is the third heart. Then we have the fourth heart. And the fourth heart, as our scholars say, is a pure heart, a content heart, a true heart. And that is the heart of a true believer. The believer that has mastered the act of growing this Iman and belief in God Almighty to the extent where it governs this believer. It governs its nafs and it is all for following the teachings of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Peace and blessings be upon him and it is not interested in what the nafs desires from the glitter and glamour and attractions of this temporary life. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant us this pure heart. Heart number four, Amin. This heart, O servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is something that God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Hadid, He says, أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الحق 
الرزق ولا يكونوا كالذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبل فطال عليهم الأمد فقست قلوبهم وكثير منهم فاسقون الله سبحانه وتعالى in سورة الحديد tells us has a time not come for the believers for their hearts to become soft and pure because of this Quran because of the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the remembrance of God Almighty has a time not come for the believers hearts to submit and become at peace and become filled with the light of guidance because of this revelation and the remembrance of God Almighty and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says and do not fall prey and become like those before you the people of the book before you they had guidance but they became a victim of time فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدِ Time overtook them فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Thus their hearts became hardened Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here talks about the heart becoming hardened فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ And when their hearts became hardened they became sinful and when they became sinful they went astray and this is the reality of the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala marries here between the heart and guidance because this heart, O servants of Allah and O children of Adam, when it's attached to the hereafter, it does indeed become soft. But when it's attached to this world, this temporary life, it does indeed become hardened. And this is the plot and ploy of the devil. His job is to make magnanimous this temporary life. So that we become attached to it and we forget that death is only the beginning and it's not the end. And we forget that there is a life after death. And as we come for this dunya, our hearts become hardened and a hard heart is not a place for Iman. Thus this life becomes a life of woes and sorrows and depression and narrow and restricted and people have difficulty negotiating the injustices of this world. And that's a fact. Those who deny the hereafter place themselves in a, in, in a quandary. The dichotomy of denying the hereafter places us in a quandary. Because how do you deal with the open injustices of this world? The hereafter is a place of justice. You might come across injustice in this world which you cannot rectify, which you cannot get your right. Maybe that injustice was done to you because you don't have the abilities to, you don't have the know-how, the power, the ability, but you take peace in that a day will come when justice will prevail. It helps the heart remain soft. It helps the heart remain sane. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the people before us and how prophets were sent to them and how they were guided but they became victims of time. And understand that a hard heart is the worst heart. It's worse than anything you can, you, you can talk about. Think about the hardest thing you can think about right now. What do you think it is? A rock? A rock? A rock is hard. A hard rock is better than a hard heart. Because you can still benefit from a hard rock. Have you not seen where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah talks about rocks? Allah says, وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْحِجَارَةِ لَمَا يَتَفَجَّرُ مِنْهُ الْأَنْهَارِ وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَشَّقَّقُ فَيَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ الْمَا وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَهْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Allah talks about the types of rocks and says they are rocks that split asunder and streams flow out of them. Is that not beneficial? And they are rocks that allows water to come out of them. Is that not beneficial? And they are rocks that fall down in servitude and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. A rock which is hard, O servants of Allah, is better than a hard heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Our hearts, O servants of Allah, become sick. They become sick physically when we have a bad diet when we live a high stressful life right our arteries become blocked may allah protect us from this and we need 
operations known as bypasses and triple bypasses. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his protection. And we ask Allah to ease the difficulties of those going through those operations right now. Or those who have undergone those operations. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower ease upon their families. Ameen. May it be so. This heart becomes physically sick. And when it's physically sick, we need a doctor, a physical doctor. But this heart, O servant of Allah, and O child of Adam becomes spiritually sick as well. There are many spiritual sicknesses of the heart. And I want to share with you three of them. The first sickness, as our scholars say, as deduced from the sources of the Sharia, is a sickness known as Marad al ghafla the sickness of heedlessness. And Marad al-Shahwa, the sickness of following your desires. Wa Marad al-Shak, the sickness of doubt. These are sicknesses of the heart. Let's start with the sickness of doubt. The sickness of doubt is of two types. The first one is a disease where one doubts everything they do. There are some people in society Whatever they do, they doubt that they did it. Because they have become engulfed by the whispers of the devil. This is known as wiswas. So they observe ablution and they doubt that they observed ablution. They do it again. And they do it again. And they do it again. And they do it again. There is someone who left salah because they were so tired of the wudu. They would spend hours making wudu because they'd observe wudu and doubt that they made wudu. This is a sickness. It happens to some people. They have a chemical imbalance. It's a physical uh, element to it as well as a spiritual element. The devil whispers to them, makes them doubt. They lock their house. They take a few steps. They doubt that they lock their house. They go back, check the door. Then they take a few steps. They doubt again. They come back, they check the door. Then they take a few steps. They doubt again. They come back, uh, they check the door. There's some people, they greet you, and then they greet you, and then they greet you, and then they greet you. SubhanAllah, I came across a person, he would greet you 15, 20 times, one after the other. Assalamu alaikum. No, no. Assalamu alaikum. No, 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 no. Assalamu alaikum. He's doubting himself. This is known as marad al shak It's a sickness. And we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his protection from it. We might have people who we know who have fallen prey to the sickness. How do we deal with the sickness? The scholars say that you should have trust in God Almighty. If you observe wudu once and you doubt that you've done it, consider it done. Whether you did it or you don't do it, consider it done and move on to salah. If you say Allahu Akbar and you begin the salah and now you doubt that you've begun the salah, forget about it. Consider yourself having begun the salah. Whether you did it or you didn't do it. And with time, you will cure yourself from the spiritual disease. The spiritual disease of the heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the sickness. Then, there's a second sickness of a shak And this is a more serious one. Because this is the sickness where one doubts his religion. He starts questioning his religion. After being guided to Islam, he starts questioning the presence of the Creator. He starts doubting it. He hasn't denied it, but he starts doubting it. If he denies it, he becomes a disbeliever. He hasn't denied it, but he's doubting it. He starts doubting the instructions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we found this in some of the universities. Because the universities are places of academia, right? And, and places where uh, people of all backgrounds of life are present. Even those who deny the presence of a creator. So sometimes they spread shubuhat misconceptions and this person lacks the necessary knowledge to necessitate his protection from these misconceptions and then it starts playing time and time again over in his mind and he starts doubting he'll tell you why do after i relieve myself may allah honor you all why do i have to observe ablution it involves washing other parts this is a question that some of some of those who have entered this realm of shirk ask. Why ask this question? Do it because it was an instruction from the best person who walked the face of this earth, the final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
It was established that he did it, beyond doubt. The evidences that establish that he did it, there's no doubt regarding them. Thus you do it. It's the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in doing it. This is a sickness of the heart. And we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection from it. May Allah protect our youth from the sickness. The sickness of doubting the principal matters of religion. The solution to the sickness, and I think you've become accustomed to uh, some of my lectures. I, I, I don't prefer, I know it takes sometimes time, but I don't prefer just to share the knowledge and move on. There has to be tangible benefits. Otherwise, I feel, as I said yesterday and the day before yesterday, that I came to entertain you all. There has to be tangible benefits. I can't leave you knowing that there's sicknesses without giving you at least one solution. Right? We need, we, we need a whole workshop on this. مَا لَا يُدْرَكُ كُلُّهُ لَا يُتْرَكْ جُلُّهُ That which cannot be done in its entirety should not be left in its entirety. So I'll share you some solutions. So bear with me. Our ulama say that the solutions to the sickness of doubt is seeking knowledge is seeking knowledge that nullifies doubt. And when you seek this knowledge, ponder over the knowledge. Don't be somebody who just takes and takes and takes like a blind follower. No, Allah Almighty gave you a mind and He gave you a heart. Ponder over that which you've learned. Allow it to digest and become a part of you. Then we have another sickness. And this sickness is known as the sickness of shahwa. The sickness of following one's desires. We know something is right, but we don't do it. And we know something is wrong, but we still do it. A person who does this is a person who has the sickness of following his or her desires. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the sickness of shahwa in his book. He says, فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ فَيَطْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٍ وَقُلْنَ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the females not to beautify their speech in the presence of males lest you should be a means of instilling desires in their hearts for you and these desires lead to greater harm like fornication and so on and so forth. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? فَيَطْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٍ they beautify their, vo their voices in front of people who have in their hearts the sickness. Which sickness? The sickness of following their desires. Right? Naturally, the genders are inclined to each other. They have a desire for each other. But do you fall prey to this desire every time? No. Why? Because you should be governed by Islam and Iman and the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not someone who's sick and engulfed that you fall prey in following your desires even though you know it's wrong. So this ayah in the Quran makes prevalent the presence of the sickness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the sickness. Again, the solution is to attain knowledge. Attain knowledge that makes you understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Knowledge that makes you remember that your life will come to an end. Knowledge that makes you understand that the life that you have not that, that you have currently is not in your control. Remember I asked you the other day, I said, who can take an oath by God Almighty? Who can challenge God Almighty? That the next breath they're supposed to breathe, they will breathe it. Remember I said that? And there were no takers. So if you cannot Take an oath by God Almighty that the next breath you will breathe, that the next breath you're supposed to breathe, you will breathe, then understand how fragile your life is and understand how close death is. And this is a means of fixing this love for one's desires. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَادِ مِنْ لَذَّاتِ Increase the remembrance of that which kills all desires. Which kills all desires. And that is death. That is death. The pious predecessors before us, those from the best of generations, they would remember death and it would, it would keep them extremely occupied. Ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, it is said that sometimes his students would ask him questions and it would be at a time when he remembers death and he would be so busy in his thought about death that the question 
would not be recognized. And he would have to apologize to his students and ask them to repeat and tell them that I thought about death and I forgot about each and every one of you around me. That's how busy he made himself regarding it because death is a reality and we should not live our lives asleep. And when death comes, we, we, we wake up in shock. Rather, let us live our lives awake. And when we pass away, it's something which we expected. It's something which we expected. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Then we have the third sickness. And that is the sickness of heedlessness. And this is something pertinent to everyone in the audience today, including myself. Because shaitan, if he can't stop you from doing something good, he's willing to settle for a 50-50. It's not a win-lose for him. He's willing to settle for a 50-50. If he can't stop you praying, he will affect the quality of your prayer. If he can't stop you doing good, he'll make you forget death. So you become weak in the goodness that you do and maybe tread the path of Eva. As I said, we all know about death, but we forget it. It's just like the person who drives his car on the highway and he sees the sign. What's the speed limit here? 120 kilometers? He sees the sign, 120. 100. Jazakallah khair. We have to be, uh, I'm not encouraging people to speed. Drive at the speed limit. So the speed limit is 100 kilometers an hour and he sees the sign. And after a kilometer, he sees the sign again. And after a kilometer, he sees the sign again. Does it mean that you didn't see the first sign? No. Does it mean that the country has a lot of steel and paint? They love to paint 100, 100, 100 and stick it at every kilometer? No. They're reminding you in case you forgot. Because you know it's 100 but sometimes it's a V6 engine. You forget about it being 100. So you need to be reminded that listen it's a V6 but don't forget it's 100. <laughs> this is ghafla, heedlessness. We live our life in a state of heedlessness. And heedlessness is not something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about heedlessness. He says, وَلَقَدْ ذَرَأْنَا لِجَهَنَّمَ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا أُولَئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْغَافِلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says many from mankind and jinn kind have been created for the hellfire. They have hearts that physically beat but those hearts are spiritually dead. They have eyes that physically see but those eyes are spiritually blind. They have ears that physically hear but those ears are spiritually deaf. La ilaha illallah. They are in a state of oblivion, in a state of heedlessness. Allah Almighty says, kal-an'am." They are the same as cattle. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, they worse than cattle. Because cattle have not been given the cognitive abilities that you and I have been given. Who are they? ghafilun. They are the heedless ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from being heedless. What causes ghaflah? What causes heedlessness? Our scholars say that plenty knowledge of this world and not balancing it or beating it with knowledge of the hereafter causes ghafla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Rum, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِّنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ They know everything about the realities of this world. But with regard to the hereafter, they're totally ignorant. They know everything about this world and we know how science has developed. We know how science has developed. And they have found findings that when a believer hears about them, it only makes them more in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It makes us more in awe of the Creator. But there are others who are heedless. They learn these amazing facts and it takes them even further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Someone asked me the other day and said, it's amazing that the scientists have 
this process known as atheism when it should bring them closer to the presence of a God because of how amazing the discoveries are and that is true but the problem with science and my answer to him was it's something that lives within the scope of physics and that which is physical anything which is metaphysical it has a problem with thus thus they might get to a stage where they become amazed but they'll attribute it to nature maybe because nature is physical it's something tangible it's something that can make sense to them our discussion is not science and atheism but this is just an answer based on a question that you have so this is ghafla and this is heedlessness and its cause is knowing too much about this world and not balancing it with knowledge of the hereafter learn as much as you want of this world but tie it to the hereafter for this world will come to an end and the life of perpetual time and space is the life of the hereafter so allow your findings of this world to make you more informed about the hereafter and let it not be specific to the temporary may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding our, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he warned us against this dunya he said فَإِنَّهَا حُلْوَةٌ خَضِرَةٌ this world is sweet and green it has glitter and glamour it deceives us so be wary of it don't fall prey to it there's glitter and glamour that's what it is it's like seeing something amazing but as you walk up to it you find it's plastic isn't there some vehicles we purchase and we say ah oh, it's all plastic in the picture it looks nice and it's it's done up nice but it's plastic right it's not the amazing metals that we thought it was we were deceived this is this world and that is why the best person who walked this world sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us against it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that there is nothing about this life again focus in on the closed ended sentence there is nothing about this life except mata except pleasure and ghurur deceptive pleasure it's temporary you are healthy one day you are sick the next you are strong one day you are weak the next you are wealthy one day you are poor the next you are alive one day and you will be dead the next may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us death whilst he's pleased with us Hassan al-Basri said regarding this concept of knowing too much of this world and not having enough knowledge about the hereafter he said that there are people and you recognize in them their knowledge regarding the intricacies of currency but they don't even know how to observe salah properly this is a means of becoming heedless too much knowledge about the dunya less knowledge about that which you need in the akhirah salah the first pillar after the shahada the first concept that god almighty will question us about on the day of qiyamah we lack knowledge of it but we have intricate knowledge regarding the temporary which is currency our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that he does not fear poverty as a difficulty over us he does not fear poverty as a difficulty over us rather he fears that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open for us this world the treasures of this world the luxuries of this world and as a result we will start competing with one another in it as those before us did and this will destroy us as it destroyed them remember the ayah in surah al-hadid they became a victim of circumstance and time thus their hearts became hardened and thus they were from the sinful what does it mean that they became a victim of, of, of time what it means is that they began competing with one another during the time in this world regarding the temporary of this world may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from a hard heart Amen. How do we fix ghafla? How do we fix this concept of heedlessness and becoming people who are aware? We wake up aware and we go to sleep aware. How do we fix this? Our scholars say that the, one of the most effective ways of doing this is to stay away from 
living in excess, staying away from excess. Everything in excess is bad for you. Too much wealth is bad for you. Too much sleep is bad for you. Too much food is bad for you. Food, we need food. We need sleep. But if we are excess with regards to it, the results become counterproductive. Sleep is productive for us when done in its, in its limit and capacity. If we exceed that capacity, the results are counterproductive. Eating is good for us. But if we exceed the limitations of consuming food, the results are counterproductive. Just a couple of days ago, somebody said that millions are being spent on research regarding overeating. Because, and somebody answered, I haven't verified the facts, but somebody answered, this is because more people are dying from obesity and overeating than from other causes. Wallahu a'lam, I didn't authenticate or research this, but this was a discussion that happened, believe it or not, over the dinner table. <laughs> the point here is living in excess. Living in excess. We shouldn't live in excess. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf, and we should learn how Islam is a way of life. That even Islam has revelation regarding how we eat and how much we eat. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya bani adam khudhu zinatakum inda kulli masjidin wa kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu innahu la yuhibbu al-musrifin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, children of Adam, addressing everybody, the believers and the disbelievers, because we know sometimes Allah Almighty says, O oh, you who believe. O oh, you who believe. Here he says, Ya Bani Adam, O oh, children of Adam, Khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. Ensure that you dress appropriately when you observe the prayer. Use the most beautiful of clothing. Don't observe salah in your pajamas. Right? Nobody goes out of the home in their pajamas. So how can you stand in front of God Almighty in your pajamas? Right? Khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. Masjid here, as the scholars of tafsir say, is inclusive of both the masjid like this that we're sitting in right now, as well as the place of sujood. Masjid also refers to the place of prostration. So wherever you pray, ensure that you, you dressed appropriately. And then God Almighty says, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا And eat and drink, وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا But do not be excessive. إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Indeed, God Almighty does not love the excessive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Furqan, He praises the Ibadul Rahman. He praises the servants of the Most Merciful. He praises His servants. And then He goes on to mention their qualities. And from their qualities, He says subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are those that when they spend, they are not excess, excessive in their spending. Nor are they stingy. They are right in the middle. They spend from their extra. They spend whilst their families are fed and looked after. It. And in the same breath, they're not stingy. They don't pride themselves from being people who never stick their hands in their pockets to take out a dime for the impoverished. They don't pride themselves on that. The point to note here from this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against being a nation that pride themselves on being excessive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about being a miser and about being excessive again in another ayah, in Surah Al-Isra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِقِ وَلَا تَبْسُطُهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطَ فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْسُورًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and let your hand not be tied to your neck like a miser. You keep your hands far away from your pockets. 
nor stretch it forth to its utmost reach like an excessive spender. Shopaholic. Right? There's a term now, shopaholic. Allah says, do not keep your hands far away from your pockets, strangling your neck. And in retrospect, do not stretch it out too far where you become an excessive spender so that you become blameworthy and in severe poverty. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against being people of excess. So to cure the sickness of heedlessness, become people who don't overdo anything. Don't speak too much. Don't socialize too much. Don't eat too much. Don't drink too much. Don't work too much. When we work too much, how does it make us? We start hating the work that we do. And subhanAllah, if we look at the Sharia, ah, the objectives of the Sharia, ah, Imam Shatibi, rahimahullah, in his amazing, amazing book known as Al-Muwafaqat, it's a book in Usul al-Fiqh, he says that the Sharia ah prescribed five times daily salah and fasting the month of Ramadan and not every month of the year and not every day of the week and not more than five times daily salah. Why? Because if it becomes too much for the believer, it becomes something known as excess. When it becomes known as excess, it becomes something disliked to him. It has counterproductive results on his or her heart. La ilaha illallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also legislated the sharia with balance. With balance. So take this lesson, O servants of Allah. Take this lesson. Don't be excessive. The next formula for ridding yourself of heedlessness is choosing good company. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also taught us and the sharia has also taught us how to choose our friends. Islam is a way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. O you who believe, be God conscious of God Almighty and choose a truthful friend circle. And our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that a person who has a good friend is like a person who has a friend who sells perfume. When you visit this perfume seller and he's generous, he'll give you a bottle of perfume and you would have benefited in a great way. And if he's not so generous, he will allow you, he will spray some perfume on you. So you will still benefit. And if he's not that generous, then you being in his presence in the environment of this perfume shop will allow for the sense of the shop to rub onto your clothes. So when you leave this gathering and you meet someone somewhere else, they'll know where you came from. So whether you intended to benefit or you didn't intend to benefit, if you, if you live and stay in a, uh, in a group that is considered a good friend circle, you will benefit somehow. A good friend circle is that friend circle that reminds one another of the grave that reminds one another about the fragile nature of this life, that reminds one another about the laws of God Almighty. And when you do wrong, they sincere advisors to you. They come to you and say, no, you shouldn't do that. They're not people who want to see your downfall. This friend circle helps remove you from the state of heedlessness. And in retrospect, our beloved Prophet wasallam said that a bad friend circle is like a person who has a friend who smells iron. When you go visit this friend in his workplace, as he smells iron, as he works by the blast furnace, a spark will fly out from the blast furnace and burn your clothes. Thus you have lost in a great way. And if you say, this is bad company, but I still want to go there, I'm heedless. This is the friend circle that I need, but I will be careful. I will stand far from the blast furnace then know and understand that the black smoke of that environment will attach itself to your clothes and stain your clothes. So whether you like it or not, you have still lost. And if you say, I will be super careful and I will stand by the door of the room that leads to this blast furnace, then understand that the fumes in the air, the monoxides in the air, you will have to breathe it whether you like it or not. So whether you intend to or you don't intend to, you only stand to lose when you live in a bad friend circle. A bad friend circle talks about this world more, 
talks about following your fancies and desires more, makes you a person in oblivion with regards to the hereafter, thus you enter a period of heedlessness. The third solution, fixing your glances. The scholars say that to remove heedlessness, fix what your eye sees. Now from the outset, if I asked you all, what do you think this means? You'd say it means we should lower our gaze. We should not look at uh, females, uh, gender of the, uh, of the, uh, meaning uh, uh, people of the opposite gender, for example. We should lower our gaze, be humble people. Right or wrong? This is correct. Well done. <laughs> this is correct. But there's another meaning to this. And what our scholars teach us is that when you look at something amazing, the Victoria Falls, or maybe your beautiful wife, or for the sisters, their handsome husband, mashallah. When you look and you see something which amazes you, don't leave it unrestricted. Restrict it and immediately tie it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tie that which you love to the one who you should love. Write this in gold, if you have gold pens. Right? This is a quote, it's copyright. Tie that which you love to the one who you should love. This is how you restrict your glances. You don't allow the amazing thing of this world that you've seen to harden your heart. Rather, you allow it to build your heart and soften your heart and make you more aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tie that which you love to the one who you should love. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding of this. The next point, O servants of Allah, and I'll end with this. Don't worry, this is the last point is ibadah, is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm not talking about any worship. I'm not talking about that worship which is a norm. How we wake up in the morning and shower and get dressed and have breakfast and go to work and drive on the same road, in the same car, in the same way, to work and sit there the same way and come back the same way and listen to the same things on the radio. It's called a norm. I'm not talking about a worship which is a norm. I'm talking about true worship. As we discussed in the Jumu'ah Khutbah yesterday. That which, is, which you're aware of, which your heart feels. Not a worship where you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in salah and you say Allahu Akbar with your hands and your heart did not do the takbir. And then you went into, in, you, 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 you bowed down, you went into ruku'ah, but your heart didn't go into ruku'ah. And you went into sujood, but your heart didn't prostrate. And you observed your salah, but only your body observed salah, not your heart. I'm talking about real worship. Real worship cures the heart. I'm talking about a worship, O servants of Allah, that when you say Allahu Akbar, the heart says Allahu Akbar. And the heart understands that I'm standing in front of Allah Almighty. And it's just possible that Jannah is on my right. And the hellfire is on my left. And the angel of death is behind. Or maybe in front. And it could be my last prayer. It could be my last prayer. So I'm going to make full use of it. I'm talking about true worship. Where the heart is engaged in that worship. I'm talking about when you fast the month of Ramadan. It's not that your body is starved. When you started your fast, your heart started fasting as well. Many times people say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Salah puts an end to evil and puts an end to immorality. But how come we have Muslims who observe salah, but they engage in interest-based transactions? Their, business are, their businesses are built on interest, for example. They observe the salah, but they speak vulgar words. How come? Isn't salah supposed to put an end to this? We say, yes, it is. But the problem is, they observe salah with their bodies and not with their hearts. The only benefit they gain from the prayer is that the angel ticks that they prayed the prayer. That's it. But they didn't earn the maximum rewards they could from that prayer, nor did they earn the maximum benefits of that prayer. Some people say, fasting the month of Ramadan, <coughs> excuse me, fasting the month of 
Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says from the wisdoms of fasting for one month is لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may attain God consciousness. But how come we have people who fast the month of Ramadan, the whole month, and on the day of Eid, they're giving a bad impression of Islam. They drive their cars with loud music in neighborhoods. And they disturb the Muslims and the non-Muslims. In some places, subhanAllah, non-Muslims have to leave that city because of the harm of these Muslims. So where is the taqwa? Where is the taqwa? And I said, no, don't blame the fast. The fast is there to help you develop God consciousness. However, they fasted with their bodies and not with their hearts. It was a physical fast. They lost weight. That's what they did. But they didn't feed their hearts. Subhanallah. When the body starves in the month of Ramadan, the heart becomes fed. But they failed to do this and they failed to attain this. And that's why it's important when we judge Islam, judge Islam based on its sources. Don't judge it based on you and me. Don't judge it based on what I do or what the Muslims do. And this is sad that we have to say this. Wallahi, it's sad. Until when, O servants of Allah, until when, O children of Adam, do we have to read about Islam in books and listen about Islam on CDs and on tapes and MP3 recordings? Until when? When are we going to see Islam in and amongst us, moving Muslims around us, those who live and breathe Islam? The teachings of Islam are prevalent in their lives, as was in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ Aisha radiallahu anha, his wife says, his character was the Qur'an. When are we going to strive to make our character the Qur'an? When, O oh servants of Allah? When death knocks our door? When it's too late? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from heedlessness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from doubt. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from following our desires. I've taken much of your time. I do leave this evening. And my heart is attached to yours, so I didn't realize the time, subhanAllah. I love you all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly unites us again. But please help honor this love that we have by truly allowing this visit that Allah has blessed us with. He allowed you to visit me and me to visit you. It's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bless this love by making a real difference in your life. That we sat together and we learned together from the inheritance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it wasn't that we sat and we had an iman boost. May Allah give us an iman boost. But then as we departed, this boost departed as well. And we went back to our old ways as soon as we sat in our vehicles. As soon as we sat in our vehicles, in the passenger seat was shaitan. And shaitan said, well done, now let's get back to work. Let it not be that. Let it not be that. I implore you, my brothers and sisters. I implore you, my mothers and fathers. I implore you, O servants of Allah. And implore you, O children of Adam, as those who I love for the sake of Allah. I love because the, the bond of Islam that we have between us, I implore you to make a difference. You are not created to just breathe the air of this earth and just be somebody who's taking space on the face of this earth. You are not. You were created to be more than that. You were created to be a selfless person. You were created to be a person who lives for the sake of Allah, who lives to serve Islam and the Muslims for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are a person of substance. You are a person of substance. So go home and analyze how you can become that person of substance. Start tonight by taking a paper and write down the sins that you are weak with. Start tonight by doing that. And set a timeline on how you're going to rid yourself from these sins. I'm not saying dump the sins today, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all merciful. If you have a sincere intention to dump them, inshallah he will grant you the life to dump them. He'll give you in the life that you need to get rid of them. Don't dump them all at once because if you let go all at once, they come back all at once. Ask yourself, what sins can I get rid of immediately? And which are the major sins that affect me greatly? 
and work on them. Work on them. Remember, our life, and, our life is a journey to Allah. We are plowing like the farmer. It needs effort. We're not in paradise. If you feel that your life is easy, there's something wrong with you. We're not in paradise. And as you write that form, write a list of good deeds that you aspire to bring into your life. And slowly but surely bring them into your life. Not all at once, because if you bring them all at once, they will go all at once. Slowly but surely. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَإِنَّ مِنْ أَحَبِّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ قَلْ The most beloved actions to God Almighty are those actions which are small, which are little, but continuous. But continuous. It is better for you to recite one ayah in the Qur'an every single day rather than reading the Qur'an once a month on one day. So if you decide that I want to be a person, I want to start by looking after the Sunan al-Rawatib. The Sunan al-Rawatib, right? The voluntary prayers that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam maintained, which are situated around the obligatory prayers. Start by being continuous with one. Start by observing two raka'at, the, the, the Sunan raka'at of Salatul Fajr. Start with that. Make it part and parcel of your life. And be sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you want to attain the rest. And when you become constant with it, introduce some more, and then introduce some more, and then introduce some more. I want to fast more. Start fasting Monday. Don't do Monday and Thursday. Start with Mondays. It might take you one year of only fasting on a Monday. It's fine. As long as you're continuous with it, Allah loves it. And inshallah, Allah will open your heart and make it easier for you to take on the next step. Salatul Duha, the salah that's prayed after sunrise and before, Zawal, before the sun reaches its zenith. Start with it if you want, one day a week. But make sure every day of that week you observe it. And then make it twice and thrice until it becomes a part of your life. Slowly but surely, but please start. And let this be the point of your start. For Allah, it would be the coolness of my eyes if I met you one day and you bore testimony to the precedence of this trip. It would make it feel worthwhile for me and I'm sure it will make it worthwhile for you. For time is something that as every second passes, we move closer to our grave. And we don't want to make all the seconds we've spent together worthless. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us death whilst he's pleased with us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a grave which is a garden from the gardens of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise us on the day of Qiyamah when we are from the people of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us underneath his arsh on the day of Qiyamah, underneath his throne on the day of Qiyamah, as we love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our standing in front of him easy on the day of Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us our book of good deeds in our right hands on the day of Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enter us into paradise without accountability an automatic and immediate entrance. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only grant us paradise, but paradise with Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon all able. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a gathering that is forgiven upon its departure. Once again, I love you all for the sake of Allah. Any mistakes from myself are from myself and shaitan. And I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. And everything correct that I've said is from God Almighty. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And he is perfect. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu wa sallama. Wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.